to do here is show you the steps to doing a QSort analysis in our software using the Q method package. So um, to do this, the first thing you want to do, of course, is change to the appropriate working directory. Um, you can use this, the CD for change directory command, or you can use drop downs from here to change to the working directory where you have your data and so forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next thing you want to do is you want to open your package. Um, if you have not yet installed Q method, you want to install the Q method package. Going over to packages here, click on install. And if you type in um, Q method and click install, you should, you'll be able to install it that way. <clears throat> so that's the first step that you want to, to do. I've already installed the package, so I'm not going to do that again. The second thing you want to do is you want to um, open that package. So um, you can run this command library Q method, or you can just find the package down here and check the box next to it. Okay. It doesn't show anything here because I've already opened the package um, during this session. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to import your data and check that it's that it's correct. Now I've done another video on how to get it in the correct format. The important thing is it's got to be in this DAT format as, um, here with a DAT extension. It's a very particular format. It, again, look at look at my other video on how to format your file to find out how to do that. But you want to run it and save it in some kind of an object. I'm just naming that capital D for data. And uh, I'm going to click run here and open that. Okay, so this, you'll see this down here if it was done correctly. This is just a, a sample data set I've got here with just six Q sorts. I was just um, reading in a, a um, sample file here. I'll use one in just a minute that's got a, a, a few more so that, so that we can do an actual Q sort with it. When you're done, you want to run this, um, the, just type in D or um, run the line that says D to look at it, and it should look like something like this, okay? Here I've got my sorts, just six in this little example data set, my statements and the scores. It should look like this if it's all read in quick, um, correct. Okay, now I've read in a, a larger data set that's got um, more sorts in it um, so that we can do an example here that's a little more substantive. Um, so here you see I've got 27 sorts with 48 statements in this example. It's still a, still a smaller analysis in some ways, but um, allows us to do a little bit more with it. We've got the 27 sorts and 48 statements in this particular case. All right. So the next thing we've got to do is decide on how many factors you want. There's a variety of ways to determine that. Um, one is, of course, use the um, trial and error, okay? We could use the num um, one factor for every about 68 participants is, a, is often a, a good guideline, which in this case, say with 27 sorts, I might have, you know, um, at most four factors um, using that guideline, maybe, maybe a few more than that, um, maybe four to... Uh, six or something like that using Humphrey's rule which I've written a code here to do which basically looks at comparing the the, the square of um, uh, loadings okay um, looking at cross product product sorry cross products of loadings and comparing that to errors the standard errors then we've got magic number seven which often people find you know seven's a, a number that uses um, there's a guideline to keep factors with two or more um, significant sorts loading on it. Um, <coughs> though there might be cases where you want to keep a factor with just one sort. Eigenvalues and scree tests, as we do with an EFA, um, not generally we'll end up with way too many sorts with an eigenvalue um, rule. A number of eigenvalues greater than one or a scree test test will generally give you, I mean, too many factors, too many factors as well as I find Humphrey's rule myself. Leaves me with too many factors. And then judgment based on interpretation, I find that that's the very best way to do it in the end is to use your judgment, but I might use some of these guidelines as a starting point to tell me what to do. Well, let's say that I use seven, use that magic number seven to start with, okay? 
<clears throat> this command here, this Q method, all I've got to do is tell it the name of the um, object that I saved the, the data in and the number of um, factors I want to result. Okay, I store it in something. I'm going to look at the summary of something. So we're just going to look at those lines for the moment. First, I run it. Okay, you make it, it's, there's few cases in which you make it an error. Okay, if you're trying to do something infeasible or there's some kind of a problem in your data, you could end up with an error, but I rarely find an error. This does it um, by default using very max um, rotation, which is this, what's commonly done. Okay, and then I'm going to look at a summary of those results to tell me how it turned out. Now, if I open this up and look at it, what I'm going to see here in this summary is most of the things I, I'd want to look at right off. <coughs> this says um, factor scores. That's really your factor array matrix right there. Okay, so, so if I have um, seven factors, this is giving me the, you know, the kind of, kind of a, the typical um, score you get for someone who loads on that factor. Down below, I'm getting a reliability coefficient, um, number of loading Q sorts. Okay, for each of these, you see that I have two of my factors that only have one sort each, so I probably want fewer fewer factors. I have eigenvalues showing here. Um, you can see they're all significantly above one, which you might, if you did EFA, say, oh, I really need more. I probably need more factors than that. Well. No, you don't. Um, this gives you generally too many. Percentage of explained variance by that factor, so you can kind of look in and see what it's, you know, sums to with all of these. A composite reliability for the factor and the standard error of the factor scores for that factor. So you get all that information from the, the summary. And of course, you can pull out details out of it. This next command right here shows you how to just get the factor array matrix alone. <coughs> And then you can save that with some kind of a name. This is an old name from something else. Um, I'll just put that generic in there. So you can save that um, factor array matrix to do your, do your analysis on it. But for now, I've got to think a little more carefully about what I want to do, um, whether I feel comfortable with this number of factors. Well, you know, one thing that stood out to me as a red flag is I've got two with ones. Okay, down here, um, I might try Humphrey's rule. I've written a little program here myself to, to run that. Um, I'll go ahead and, and run that, just pulls from those results. And this basically tells me which of the factors satisfy um, Humphrey's rule. You can see all seven do. But seven is really too many based on the <clears throat> not wanting one, just one factor to load on it rule. I mean, one one sort to load on a factor rule, but also based on this six to eight participants. So, you know, with with um, with twenty seven sorts, you know, I would I wouldn't want to have seven um, would be too many. Seven would be too many. So I might want to have you know uh, four or five probably realistically. Well, let's go back and and rerun this. Um, just changing this to one sort. I like to just reduce one at a time, see what happens. Because sometimes just, even though I had two factors that just had one sort, sometimes by reducing it by one, maybe those two combine onto a factor. We're not sure what will happen, so we're going to try it this way. I run that, and I look at it here, and look, actually, I, that's what happened probably, or something similar to that. I end up with nothing with just one um, one. One, just no factors with just one person loading on it. So by that rule, I'm pretty good. I have six factors, which is maybe by the six to eight participants rule a little high. I have, um, I can run um, Humphrey's rule again here. Let me scroll down so I can get the whole thing. I can run Humphrey's rule here and see, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. They all look like they satisfy Humphrey's rule, all of them do. So I may want to start with actually um, six factors as my starting place to analyze. I may want to look at it, see if I get any um, substantive information out of those, whether it 
whether it makes any sense. If that's the case, what well, one thing I'll do is go up here, look at um, just this line 21, just saving, give it some kind of a name that's meaningful to me, just saving it, I, I might go ahead and say something like, um, you know, factors six or something like that to save it as, or, or maybe I give it even more than that, and I say, you know, array with factor six, and I save that so that, so, and I hit that and hit save, so that I can go back and, you know, do my analysis of, of that, my more qualitative type analysis of the results there. But then I might also go back and do it with five factors, four factors, and so forth, so that I can see what makes sense when I'm done. Um, another thing that we'll want to do is we we'll want to look at um, seeing which individuals load on which factors. Right here, I can get this by running this command, the, the LOA dot and dot flags um, <coughs> function on my results. And you see I get it here, or I can um, write it to a tape. So um, what this shows me is for each factor, which sorts um, significantly load. Now, the way it does it here, you can see it by, if, if we go in and, and looking at this help, for Q flag, that the ones that have asterisks are ones that have been flagged as significantly loading on that factor. In order to understand how it does that, we could look at the help for this Q flag um, um, function in the package, which is used by this load.flags here. If you want to see the details of how it's done, you can road, come down here and you see Q sorts, factor loading. I um, is higher than the threshold for this. Basically, those are statistically significant, okay? Q sorts at square loading is higher than the sum of square loadings in the Q sort, all other factors. So basically, in order for this, for let's just look at line 12, for that to have been flagged, it had to be statistically significant. But also squaring this value had to be higher than the sum of squares of all these other values, of all, you know, the the loadings on all the other factors. So if both of those criteria are met, then it's then it's given it an asterisk here. You might use some other um, approach yourself, but that's what's done with the software. So I can see here um, which ones sort on which factors, so I can use you know demographic information, et cetera, to help help interpret those factors. If I go up here again to my to my code, you'll see I can write those results, I've got to give it some kind of a, a name. Uh, this is actually six factors in this case. And I hit save and I can look at that. So, so that's something that might be um, helpful to look at later. There's some other things you can look at. Um, this particular thing gives you just some of the other data that we saw when we just ran the summary command, adding values, reliability, and all those kinds of things. Um, we can get just by, by running that. Um, or by writing it, okay, what we're going to see here is, okay, we've got this um, results here. This tells me the reliability, the number that load on it, eigenvalues, etc. This gives me the correlations amongst the factors, which might be of interest to you, and, the, and, um, and so forth. Now, um, I have up here to write this as a table um, <clears throat> as well, if you want to do that. So there's various things that, that you can look at. Some other things you might want to look at. This command just looks at the actual factor scores as opposed to the factor array, so the, so the actual factor scores that were, were calculated as a step in getting the factor arrays. Um, here I've got showing how to do it rounded. Um, this, gives, this, this output that it'll give you distinguishes between the factors response to statement. So it basically is showing you, it does some kind of an, an analysis here where it shows you, if we look at that, <clears throat> particular statements um, and how it, this particular one distinguishes factor three. This particular statement distinguishes factor four and, uh, and so forth. And this particular statement distinguishes factor one and factor three. So it's done some kind of analysis itself where it, where it looks at for you um, how to distinguish that. Now, 
Um, that's something that I don't particularly use. I like to do that thinking myself, but it just give you an idea of something that can be can be done here. Lastly, I have um, created a little program here that creates crib sheets as described by um, Stenner and Watt in their textbook doing, or Watts and Stenner, I guess I should say, doing Q methodological research, that text. Um, this is, this creates those crib sheets for you. Um, what I've done is I've created a file that just has one column just one column, the list of all the statements, the wording of the statements. So if I read that in, okay, um, let's look at it down here. You'll see that it just has just has my list of my list of statements, okay. And then what I'm going to do is I just run this little program I've written. The last thing on it shows the the actual result. I'm going to pop this up so you can see it. What it does quite a bit here is it gives me um, a list. The first thing here you see here it's a list within a list and um, so right here this first value tells me I'm in the first factor and this is the four parts of a crib sheet. You see down here starts the second factor. The first part this is the statements that were given a, um, a plus four the highest value. Okay. Um, these are the four statements. Those in this factor tend to give a minus four, which is the lowest value. This is, these are the ones that um, aren't necessarily the highest value, but higher than in any other factor. So this, the statements that those in this, this um, factor tended to rate higher than those in other factors did, but didn't necessarily give the highest value, the plus four. And this is those that they tended to rate lower than those in other factors did but um, not necessarily the minus for the lowest value. So it goes through each of those for all my, all my factors here. In this case, my six factors. Okay, saving this because it's a list within a list is really tricky in R and I haven't written program for that at this point. So what I do is honestly, I just copy and paste, just I copy and paste it to a Word document and then um, clean it up and, and do my thinking and analysis from there. So that's something that you might also find helpful when when you do your um, analysis um, Q analysis in R.